19, um, it's 11.40, we're in the Murfreesboro Police Headquarters. I do think before we start, uh, it would be fitting to say that today is the 10-year anniversary of the Good Friday tornado. And there's many who are in this room who worked uh, extremely hard uh, during that, that event. I think it happened, Chief, if I remember, wasn't it like 2.10 or 2.30 that that happened? Yeah. Um, and and I, I was in, on, I lived on Twin Feathers, so right where the tornado came came through. I remember being huddled up in the, the laundry room, but um, two people lost their life in that event, and it was truly uh, an event where the entire community came together. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we we um, recognize that. All right, we'll move into our 2019-2020 long-range planning initiatives. All right. Talk about the planning long-range. Is the podium okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a, there's a little bit of a gap, but that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> Um, first, I want to thank the mayor, thank the council, and thank um, Craig for giving us just a few minutes to, to talk today about some of our um, upcoming long-range planning initiatives. Um, the purpose of me talking today is just to go over a few of these, um, to sort of let you know what, in the planning department, what we're thinking about some priorities for 2019, 2020, some of the studies um, and other projects that we want to engage in. I want to get your feedback on these, helping us prioritize these, letting us know if maybe we're not going the right direction, if there are some other things that you'd prefer that we look at and prioritize instead of, of what we're showing on our list. Um, I provided you with a list of 15 what we're calling major projects um, that we put in your packet. Eight of those are what I would consider long-range planning um, projects. We have uh, five of those currently in progress um, and then three that are planned over the next uh, year, year and a half to get started on. So the first thing would be uh, the land use plan update for our Murfreesboro 2035 plan. Um, over the last uh, almost two years since that plan was enacted, um, we have had about 40 rezonings that have not been consistent with the land use plan. That's, uh, yes, so that draws our attention, but at the same time, that happens. Um, when you adopt a new plan, when you go from really having no um, land use plan to having now this very all-encompassing land use plan, it's, it's not too shocking that we've had um, that many. But because we've had that many, we think that it would be good to take another look at 2035 to go back and look at some of those areas um, that we're seeing repeated conflicts with um, and, and to offer some updates for that. So we do want to get started with that pretty quickly. Um, a second thing that we are currently working on is an expansion of the city core overlay district. We came and talked to you back in, I believe, November about that. We are about to take that to the Planning Commission and ask them to set a public hearing. We have met with community groups. We had a public meeting. We feel pretty good about, um, uh, about the direction that that expansion project is going. Um, that will add about 40 pages to our zoning ordinance, um, but we think that it will help um, with revamping, revitalizing um, some of the downtown area, hopefully spur in the future some redevelopment or, or help um, in, in that process. Um, a third thing long range that we're looking at is an adaptive reuse policy. This is sort of tied to the to the CCO idea. Um, adaptive reuse is, is a major thing on Walnut Street, uh, Maple Street, where you have houses that are now serving as offices and, and small commercial businesses. And so we don't really have a policy on that right now. We do a little bit of it in planning. Building and codes has certain requirements and restrictions that they put into place on how to retrofit buildings. And so what we would like to do is get a document in front of you um, that sort of goes through a process for, for um, effective adaptive reuse. Mr. Anthony, can I yes. on that, mm -hmm. would that also apply to things like uh, maybe like a commercial property, like a big box store that leaves or a grocery store that leaves? I mean, would that also I, address yeah. that? So I definitely think that that we need to look at that, and we can tie that. That's that's in my mind. That's been sort of a separate thing, but I can tie that into that policy as well. Um, and that's something that we're going to see more and more and more. We have a proposal right now for the old um, the old Kmart building. Big lots moved into part of it, but left a large part of it unoccupied. And so now, you know, there's there's an idea for how to how to reutilize that. Um, there's going to be a vacant Sears store. There's going to you know, the, the, and so so that's definitely something that that I think we should consider. 
Um, another thing that we're looking at is the uh, chapter three of the 2035 plan, that's the transportation component. Um, that is essentially taking the major uh, uh, transportation plan and getting it into um, the text of the 2035 plan and, and that's something that's been underway for some time. We'll eventually get that, uh, get that to you. And finally, we want to um, engage this year, um, just within the next few months, in uh, an affordable housing study. The purpose of that is not to uh, prompt anybody to, to decide that we have to take action or we have to do something, but, but we do want to provide you with some up-to-date data on housing cost um, here in Murfreesboro and sort of what's being constructed, what's being built, um, so that you have that data in front of you. Instead of uh, browbeating you with where we're falling short, what I want to do with that study is emphasize some of the things that we're doing right. Um, and I'll, we'll work with um, Patty Pope and, and others to, to point out some of the programs that we do have in the city um, that we think are, are helping promote um, affordable housing. So those are the those are the five that are that are currently underway. I have three additional ones that we want to get started um, here in the next few months. Um, the first would be an old Nashville Highway corridor study um, that would include Old Nashville Highway um, and Broad Street uh, going northward. Um, we already have some conceptual ideas for the Broad 840 Future Cherry Lane um, interchange, and so we're continuing to to look at that. That would be one component of this. Um, we also are aware that Smyrna. Uh, has just completed or is in the process of completing a comprehensive plan and they've called out their portion of Old Nashville Highway um, for some uh, sort of special attention um, for future land use. So we want to work with them, we want to work with the Park Service. Um, they've already, they saw today's agenda, the Park Service saw today's agenda and contacted me um, to ask about that particular item because they want to be involved um, in anything that, that we look at with Old Nashville Highway. Um, Old Nashville Highway, by the way, was called out in the 2035 plan for requiring some, some additional um, attention. Um, a second study that we want to get started is sort of the McFadden Bridge Avenue area. To me, this is a continuation westward of the um, historic bottom study that was conducted a few years ago. And it's sort of a natural place, makes sense. There's been a lot of transition, a lot of change, and there's a lot of interest um, in that area. And right now, we treat the development there as sort of in a piecemeal manner. Everything comes in and we look at it just individually. I would like to, to have more of a, a comprehensive look um, at that, that entire area. And a final one that we would like to get started by the end of this year is uh, the MTSU Student Village Small Area Study. This again is something that was specifically called out in the 2035 plan, the idea of sort of a mixed use center um, around the campus, something that would um, attract students to want to stay um, on or near the campus as opposed to, to being so heavily um, dependent upon commuter students. Um, and so that's something that, that we want to spend some time looking at um, as well. And, and formulate some land use policies for that area as well. Um, hey, Mr. Anthony, on, on yes. the MTSU, mm -hmm. you're talking about commuter students, you're talking about students that are staying at home somewhere else and, and, and driving to, to Murfreesboro, not the people who live in Murfreesboro driving to the university. Correct. Correct. So you, you're saying you, wanna, you want to encourage more students to move to Murfreesboro but off campus. So I think two components to that. The, the first is that, that was, that's a 2035 recommendation that, that we want to follow through on. Um, as far as the, whether it's living on campus or off campus, I don't know that, that's, that that part is defined yet. The 2035 plan, part of what they're showing for the student village is on campus, part is, is in areas that lie adjacent uh, to campus. So this would involve working with campus planning um, to, to try to figure out an idea to create this, this mixed use center. And, and I think there's been some discussions and some change in uh, MTSU's uh, understanding of, of the benefits of having an on-campus housing, an active on-campus housing component um, over the last few years. And Dr. Lee now is is uh, talking about looking at on-campus housing much, much more. Maybe it's me. Huh? Um, 
computer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could be. Uh, so I think when the 2035 plan was done, that wasn't necessarily the discussion points as much as it is now. So I'm not too sure that our focus is just bringing students to live off campus, but to assist a, a, a MTSU with on-campus uh, housing as well. So those those three studies, we envision those being primarily land use studies, but there would be some design um, components to them, obviously. Um, and stakeholder participation would be very, very important. We would definitely want to hold a lot of public meetings, charrettes, that kind of thing, um, with all of those. Um, we're open to reprioritizing, um, adding anything that you see that's missing. Um, but what we think we're doing here is trying trying to create a, a long-range planning program, try to give the, help the city with visioning, try to try to help move us forward in a positive direction. Um, anything that you see um, that you want to point out to us, anything that, um, that we can change, make better, please, please let me know. Um, that's all I have for today, but I'll be happy to answer any questions or engage in any dialogue with you. Donald, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to study everything to death, but at the same time, I, I think it would be advantageous to council members as well as planning commission and planning department. Uh, if we could have a meeting that we would invite 30 people age 60 to 80, okay. 30 people age 40 to 60, 30 people age 20 to 40, and maybe 30 high school students and bring them in and divide them up into little rooms and let's see what they feel like the perfect home or how they would like to see the city development from this point forward because I look at it from my perspective of what I think a nice house is and where I would like to live and where I would like to be It's through my life. I think that is changing, and, and and I keep hearing the millennial term, but, but, but if we could get it down to age groups of maybe 20-year segments where we could say, this is what they're going to want to buy, or at least they believe they're want, wanting to buy, because I do think as you go through your life, these requirements change. But, but as far as what we're building and developing in Murfreesboro, is it truly what the market's going to demand, or is it what we just perceive is the best thing that we should build? Field, which may not be what market demand is. So I think it would be advantageous to all of us to have an understanding and, and then bring those groups together and say, okay, well, here's what the cumulative is and of people coming to our city. I think our average age is about 24 in Murfreesboro right now. If, if that's the case, then the people who are coming to our town, if they're coming here for retirement purposes, maybe they're looking for something that's closer to the hospital and less maintenance on it. If they're coming out of high school, they're probably looking for something that's small, less maintenance, so they can travel and stuff. But somewhere in there, the, there's probably a sweet spot where they might want a little more land and a little more home where they've got a larger family. And so I think it would be helpful to us if we were to get a little more definitive information from the public so that we could understand better what it is they want as much as it is what we think they need. So. I think, uh, I think that's a great idea, and I, we'll definitely follow up on that with you. Um, Diana Tomlin is back here. There she is. Um, she coordinated our CCO uh, open house workshop, whatever we want to call it, back, um, back a couple of months ago. Did a great job with it. One of the things that really stood out to me about that um, as a uh, as uh, sort of in contrast to some of the other planning meetings that we've had, we had the this great array of age ranges. It's one of the things that I that I noticed right away. Um, we definitely had twenties and millennials all the way up through through some of our um, seniors in the city, and it was it was terrific. And so for that, I think our CCO is going to be absolutely stronger because of the suggestions that we gleaned from doing that. So I, I totally like the idea and support that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we can look at, I think it's um, beginning to be a priority, is transportation, uh, the rover. Um, I think it's a big need, and I'm hearing from people who ride rover that uh, we need more time 
Um, and I think the council at one time, didn't we say we were going to look at maybe expanding it on Saturday just to see what that looks like? I think that's beginning to be a demand now in the city, a rover being operating on Saturday. I don't know if it's, if we could change some hours to where Saturday can go at least to noon because people are telling me who ride Rover that they also work on Saturday and transportation is almost impossible for them. Uh, didn't we say something about possibly looking at Rover at one time? Didn't we say that, guys? Yeah, we were talking about it. So I think that's beginning to be a big priority. We can take a serious look at that. Uh, expanding the hours for Rover, especially on Saturday. Thank you, Ms. Stills. You, you may even wind up with a different group of people who are out there riding Rover on the weekends because, uh, you know, I, I really, from a historical perspective, which seems to be where I always fall back on, the, the there's people who come to Murfreesboro for tourism, and I think our tourism is probably the greatest during the weekend, but there's no public transportation. And like when I go to Chattanooga or something like that, I love getting on their buses and riding around town and seeing their, whereas Murfreesboro, we stop running our buses around town during the weekend, which is when when I would be in Chattanooga, I guess. So, so it, uh, I think there's an opportunity here that we probably have a market uh, that we could probably target uh, as far as running between the Chamber of Commerce and running downtown that uh, would, would help not only with people commuting for jobs, but it would help uh, help educate people from a tra from a historical perspective. Uh, I know that talking with the Historical Society about it, they've even mentioned the fact that they might like to put somebody on the buses and explain some of the mm -hmm. significance of the history of the courthouse and the history of some of the buildings and stuff that you might pass when you're riding past the battlefield, be able to explain that. So somehow try, try to tie and what we're currently doing with Rover to uh, uh, almost a historical tour of Murfreesboro. And, and I think that's something that uh, there may be an opportunity to do that would be uh, really beneficial to the citizens. And, uh, and it would also reduce the number of tourists who not only don't know our roadways, but don't know where they're going. It, it would be like a sampler platter almost of being able to ride around town without having to worry about traffic and focus on what it is they're actually seeing and, and enjoy that so. Mm -hmm. so who would be in who would be the person that would get us costs and all that I mean we can't just wave a wand and say we're going to offer Saturday it's going to cost us something so we'll talk we'll talk in a few minutes about budgets and supplements to the budget and we can certainly talk about adding that to uh, I think we have a preliminary estimate on the cost of that um, and so we can add that to the supplements as we talk about those. Okay, because, you know, the other part of this is Uber, you know, the way that Uber and Lyft and those ride share programs are going to come in, you know, that's already changing pretty substantially. And those people who are, in, you know, going over to visit us or whatever, I mean, I think the, the, the Uber deal is going to change the world. And, uh, you know, if it's going to be a huge capital investment, new trucks, new buses, more routes, more drivers, more benefits, all that kind of stuff, and more and more people using Uber instead of buses. I'm not sure it, it makes all the sense in the world, but I'd love to see the numbers. I mean, I, I, we got to look at the numbers to make a decision. So, Russ, Russ, now must be me. We switch microphones. We're still doing it. Russ is taking a look at that, and we have those costs. It's you. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, so we have those costs, and as I said, we can we can turn them into. Yeah, let's see if this works. We can turn it turn it into or add that into our supplemental um, program. Yeah. Donald, could you speak a little bit to number twelve and number fifteen uh, as to what is being considered in the neighborhood meeting policy and and industrial zoning revisions? Could you speak a little bit? Absolutely. Um, neighborhood meetings right now, um, we have. A policy, but it's it's up here <laughs> as opposed to on paper, and so we we want to put that on paper. We want to take a little bit more active role. Um, so right now we 
we schedule a time and a place in conjunction with an applicant for a neighborhood meeting, and then we sort of turn it back over to the applicant to handle it from there. I think um, one of the things we get a lot of complaints about is um, didn't get proper notice, didn't get notice in time, the details on the letter were not quite uh, detailed enough. So um, what we've done is we put together about a four-page document with a sample letter that includes all of the pertinent information that, that staff would review before it could be sent out. We are going to start providing the mailing addresses for the letters to go out to ensure that everybody within the appropriate range um, is included and covered. Um, and then at the neighborhood meetings themselves, we're going to take a little bit more active role, um, introduce ourselves on behalf of the city, sort of explain what the process is, then turn it over to the applicant. The way it's been running, uh, the applicant just sort of starts running the show from the, from the beginning, and sometimes um, we've had a few where a tone gets set at the beginning and it is all downhill from there. And so I think if we take a little bit more hands-on approach, hopefully we can keep those meetings a little bit more orderly um, and, and get the desired outcomes, which the desired outcome is really for the citizens to, to give us the feedback of what would make this better, what, you know, what would improve your quality of life, what, what could help you um, with this development, um, as opposed to an hour or an hour and a half of no, 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 no. Uh, once we hear that once, you know, it's uh, hopefully we can foster dialogue to, to get people to start thinking of if there's a reasonable chance, as Sam says, if there's a reasonable chance that this is going to pass the Planning Commission and the City Council, what are some things that can be done to this project to make it more palatable um, for the existing residents or neighbors? Um, number. 15, industrial zone revisions. I will be bringing you that very quickly. Um, we want to create a, right now we have heavy industrial, light industrial. We want to create one that's sort of in between. Um, a step down from heavy industrial, it would still allow a lot of the heavier uses, but minus some of the absolute most intensive uses, um, some of the ones that people find most objectionable. Um, we want to start providing that sort of medium um, industrial zoning um, a, as an alternative. And I think, uh, based on what we've written so far, once we get that to you here very quickly, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you will find that to be a, a very good thing, a positive thing, um, and something that we'll utilize pretty frequently. Donald, one last question. I promise yes, this will be my last one. Uh, the number 11, the food truck thing, I thought mm -hmm. we, Jennifer Moody had about worked through every increment of food truck process that we could possibly do. What are we continuing to do with that? Um, so with the food truck permitting, permitting process, the reason that that's on here, that's largely just sort of internally within City Hall uh, as to how that process is handled and who coordinates. Um, so we're sort of trying to work out a process with building and codes. The other thing, the, the thing that we get hit with most frequently has to do with people with the um, push carts, hot dog cart kind of thing. And um, we, we really need to address that. We get calls, gosh, two or three times a week um, on those. And uh, we've set up a totally separate process for those. Um, actually, right now, there is no process for them. If they want to do it, they, have, they get a special use permit. They have to pay per location. So if you're wanting to move your push cart, you have to get a permit for every single location you want to move it to. That may be the policy that we want to stick with, um, but I, I think we might want to look at some other alternatives as well. I appreciate this, uh, getting this kind of uh, broader picture for what the planning department's doing. And I, uh, for me, that number three is probably, because uh, of our conversations, you can know that's probably my most important one. Do you have some kind of expectation as to when you're going to bring that forward? or um, The 2035 update? Right. That one? Mm -hmm. uh, give me four months. Four months. Four months. Okay. Well, I, you know, we, we say this a million times, but the reasonable expectations of people that are existing property owners and also reasonable expectations for developers is so important and it makes us appear to have thought through what we want as opposed to wait for a project to come before us and then shift our you know, shift the ball uh, because of somebody's desire to do something in a particular area. Uh, I think that's extremely important, and I appreciate the effort that you're going to put in to get that uh, update to us. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. On the on the 2035 land use plan update, um, one of the things that I felt like was 
you know, and maybe maybe uh, one of the results of, of what I felt like when we did the 2035 plan, we're seeing right now with having already about 40 amendments or whatever, is that that. Um, you know, it did, I never saw something that would that would be akin to really a plan as it relates to the use. I mean, we had a, a color on the map and that sort of thing, so I, I get that. But there was never, it, it, we, we never at least focused on very much saying, for example, you know, here's what our inventory of property looks like in the city. And just for an easy, uh, you know, out to the extreme example, if 90% of the property that's in the city right now is currently zoned heavy industrial just for you know then we know we probably need some residential we probably need some commercial and we probably need less heavy industrial i don't recall us ever having a discussion at either planning commission level or them having it at the planning commission level or certainly at the council member level to you know when a when a when a project is coming through you know, I, I still have never seen in five and a half years a discussion that kind of says, hey, guys, here's the deal. This is what they want to do with the property, but we've already got enough of this property zoned in the city of Murfreesboro for 20 years. We believe it's in the right locations. So, you know, from a land use plan, it not necessarily, I mean, I think if we continue to color the map, mm -hmm. We're going to continue to just have amendments and amendments and amendments and amendments and changes and changes, okay? <clears throat> I think if we take a bigger picture strategic approach to it where we say, look, we have all agreed that we need to have you know, 20% of our land needs to be commercial and 40% needs to be single family or what, whatever the right numbers are and for a lot of good reasons. That's the kind of stuff that I think that we ought to be learning that I have no clue of what the right mix needs to be. But the results of which we may be seeing now, which is a lot of changes, budget issues, you know, those things I think we're seeing now as a result of that maybe not being done quite as much in the last 10, 12, 15, whatever you name the number of years. I'd almost rather y'all spend your time on, you know, on having a strategic piece of this done before we go in and just recolor the map with, you know, just a different person with the paintbrush, if that, if that makes sense based on how that experience went. Is that? Yes, uh, and I think we can do both of those. I think we can do both of those right. things. We can offer you some policy recommendations. Ultimately, that's it's up to, to you to determine, you know, what you want to accept or, or not accept what you want to implement. Um, with regard to numbers, we have been working with Gerald Lee in the, our GIS uh, section um, to start being able to provide you some better mapping data and better numbers. I, I do want you to know that. And, mm -hmm. and um, the first thing that he did was the, the multifamily dashboard, which um, we utilize periodically. We haven't had any multifamily projects come through for a while, but um, the next time that we do, we'll certainly utilize that. We have um, one for self-storage units because that was a thing about a year ago. Um, but definitely taking a more comprehensive look and looking at all land use types, I think, um, we we can definitely we can definitely do that. Well, our, our you know our boundaries aren't finite, but right. they're somewhat finite. You know, I mean, if nobody asks to be annexed, they're finite. Right. And so you know we got to decide. Yeah, I think we need to be looking into every project that comes through. How does it? You know, how does it uh, um, incorporate into the total picture? Uh, and we literally can't afford to from a budget perspective for that to be too heavy one way or the other and and can't afford for you know to either extra to any extreme I mean not just residential but commercial and industrial all those things so anyway thank you that would be helpful thank you. I really would like if there's a way, and this probably would be with Mr. Gore. I think I saw, is he sitting? There he is. Um, if we could maybe get something over the next, I don't know, several months as we talk about the land use planning. You know, we made the decision six or eight months ago or a year ago on the step step systems. So really would like to see how 
that's progressed I, I for some reason i keep getting a concern that you know we we've typically said in the in the past and i voted to allow the the outside sewer systems that you know if if sewer is not available to the site then that pretty much determines whether a site will be developed because we do know that if sewer is available nine times out of ten if sewer is available the in infrastructure is in place to be able to provide services the roads have been built you know because when the roads are built sewers in uh, sewers installed electrics installed all those things so I, I keep getting this uneasy feeling when i see these developments that we're see we're seeing like the one on bills road we had one out on dilton mackin that as the the developments that are coming with alternative sewer systems that the infrastructure may not be in place to handle some of the other things that are coming in and the part that concerns me is more from fire police you know traffic so if you say you've got a subdivision that's 200 units and our overall tax taxes that we collect as a city on average say that we've got a thousand dollars a house on the price point of those houses you know we're collecting two hundred thousand dollars a year in, in in property taxes now that's not counting the sales tax that comes in off those those units but is that two hundred thousand dollars a year for that subdivision that's further out even cover the fire service the police service and some of those things that we're immediately having to provide so uh, I, I keep getting an uneasy feeling about that that uh, as we approve those that we're really putting ourselves in the hole because just because you can get an alternative sewer system to work does that mean that that's really the right thing as far as service delivery that we can afford it I think um, Mr. Lalance had mentioned to me before the the true cost of annexation um, being something that um, that he had wanted us to look at. Um, I know Sam and Diana have worked and worked at trying to to quantify how much annexation costs, and we are having a it's that is challenging it's it's um there is no one size fits all number but um on on that part i do want, want to let you know that that's something that we're definitely um looking at it's just it's really difficult to come up with yeah i mean i, I work in a subdivision in williamson county that the average ta tax bills six thousand dollars a house but all the streets are private um you know there's no there's no street maintenance there's no there's none of that that it, None of that is provided. So I'm with us, on the other hand, where our rate is so much lower, mm -hmm. and then the services that we provide is so much higher. You're trying to find that number, and, and I'm not sure that it works out on um, alternative sewer systems for us to be able to do that. Okay. Any other questions? Um, one of the other things I think we need to do uh, as the year progresses uh, to have a joint planning commission and city council meeting to making sure as we move forward that we're all on the same page. Kurt, would you be okay with the idea, or maybe we just ought to all talk about the, the how that sort of looks i mean for, uh, um, more of like a retreat or workshop thing it seems to be retreat, yeah it seems, I'm, I'm open you know that. round table instead of us all sitting up there at the yeah. deal and talking across the thing via <clears throat> microphone i mean i because we got stuff we could work out that i think would make all of our you know the, the city a lot easier place to do business and, and all of our you know meetings a little smoother well, we the, uh, get in there and hash it out Craig. Yeah, I think that's a yeah, that's an excellent idea because um, not and I know the not saying anything or being negative toward the planning commission at all because they do a fabulous job and the hours they put in I, I just cannot believe it um, but I think that's an excellent idea because just because the planning commission brings us a plan and they vote unanimously on that plan does not necessarily what well, does not mean that we have to vote unanimously uh, we have to pass everything they bring to us so um, I think that's good that we just get together and learn the logistics of how decisions are made. Uh, we get more information before we make decisions. I think that's excellent. 
Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Let me just want one more comment. And this is probably going to be brought up in, in another portion of this, but <clears throat> the, I didn't see something on there at the discussion of impact fees. And, and, and I just wonder if there's, is there a plan to have some kind of conversation that moves us into recovery of costs? Uh, yeah, there, there is. As a matter of fact, right now, uh, Gary Whitaker is meeting with our consultant that we've retained to begin the study so that we know uh, there, there's, there's statutorily, I believe, there's background to what we need to do in order to impact. To, to implement impact fees, and so there's quite a bit of study that needs to go behind it, and that's being started right now. Once we get that study done, then we can sit down and talk about what's uh, the appropriate amount and how that would be implemented and when and such as that. Okay, thank you. Might be timing-wise, it might be good with the, the joint meeting. Uh, that might work out on a timing-wise. We'll we'll know today. After he meets with do we, do we will he be providing a kind of a timeline on what to expect? As yeah, we should have a timeline here real quick. Awesome. Yeah. And I've made this suggestion before, and it still hadn't come to fruition, so I'll make it again. I still think we need to have a meeting with the legislative body in Nashville while they're still in session if we're going to accomplish anything in the next year with the Tennessee legislature and making sure they understand what the needs of this municipality is. We can, and we'll, and, and we'll continue to work on that. Right now they're in session, so it's hard to, to group them up and, and um, get them down, but that should end here pretty quick. Something that, we might hope. Be a, something that might be a good idea on that is um, maybe try to set something up on a Friday morning after the roundtable discuss or whatever they call the, the chamber capital deal, the Capital Connection. Capital Connection, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I actually, I mean, I agree that I would actually want to try to get it done during session. Um, and they still come down on Friday morning. You know, they're off on Fridays, and they're most of them are showing up. Is what I, I think. And then, if they could just go from there into a into a nine o'clock meeting with us or something, I'd certainly be willing to take a couple hours or whatever to to have some of those discussions. I mean, we, we and, and and they don't stay overnight in Nashville on Thursday no. nights either. They're coming back to Murfreesboro, so we can have a Thursday night meeting with them as well. So I mean, it's, there's no reason that uh, we shouldn't be able to meet with the legislators just because they're in session. Well, they're coming to budget. You know, I mean, they're 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 good. they have their budget that they're working on, and you know, I think we've had uh, probably all of us have had a discussion about this, but you know, there's some discussion in a on another front about fast tracking some road projects and stuff like that for for particular reasons, which you know, I mean, we we need to understand what the overall ramification of that is. I don't necessarily want to fast track one road project that might detract from another. I mean, so those are kind of things that I think the legislature will be able to to help us work through and. I mean, um, I'm thankful for the work that's getting done on Salem Highway, but uh, we gotta we gotta figure out what we need to do about a lot of other state routes coming through this city. But sooner rather than later, in my opinion, is why I would say try to get it done. So maybe if you reach out, that might be an opportunity. We'll do that. All right, Ms. Tucker, we'll move into. Of the open finance Thank you, Mayor. Uh, if y'all recall, last fall I brought um, Socrata to you to view, and this is an open finance software module that uh, integrates directly with our Munis financial software package. It allows users to view details about our revenues and expenses and our budgets, and provides charts and graphs so that y'all can visually compare data. Uh, we launched the portal in late February or early March. So I just want to do a quick demo for you so you can see how it works. If you go to the finance and tax page, there's a link right here at the top for the open finance portal. Yeah, there we go. So at the top, we have a message here. Uh, just welcoming users and giving some information about the module. Information is updated each night, so the information is very current. It also points out that schools and MED are not included in this. It's just the city and the water resources. Uh, we have several cards down here. And the city's cards are at the top and waters are at the bottom. We also show links to related content like our budget and our financial reports. 
sorry, it scrolls a lot here. Okay, so at the top we've got common questions. You click on that, you can see that one of the first ones is what are the city's uh, general fund top <coughs> revenues? <coughs> This takes us directly to general fund revenues. We've got different um, categories between general revenues like our taxes, public works, public safety, recreation, general government, and community and community development. So if we drill down, you can see our taxes. We've got our sales and property taxes. I'm gonna show you in a graph format how we're looking. This is our snapshot view. And down below, you can see the ledger details. And this shows revised budget versus revenues, like, or actuals, I should say. You can also switch to a pie chart view, which shows you a good representation of how much of our revenues are sales tax versus property. And you can look at things over time. So we started Munis in fiscal year 16, so that's as far back as it goes on here as well. You can also change the year you want to view up here if you want to see actuals for other years. Um, go back. So if you, um, if you want to go back, you can use this tree to the left. You can go back to general revenues and let me see. It shows it by function. And then you can also just click right back up here and it'll take you back to the home. So if we also want to look at expenses, that's under the operating budget card. I'm just going to go in, I'm going to drill down, you can click here or you can go down below to the ledger details, either one. You can see that there are links, hyperlinks there, so you can just drill down as far as you want to go here. I'm just going to keep drilling, I'm going to go to public safety and fire and rescue. This shows me fire and rescue's entire budget and there's 82 accounts, so you can just scroll over. And again, it's showing you budget to actual. So we've got our budget here and our actual there. You can see how things are falling out. Just like with the revenues, you can put that into a pie chart. You can view things over time. You can see how different, uh, different lines are going. Well, I'm trying to see something that might have variations here, which I guess theirs is pretty flat there. But are there any questions so far? That 346 million roll up operating budget, that includes what? That's everything. So that's general fund, that's the bond funds. So we budget, you know, for all of our debt issuances, we have to budget to actually spend the, the debt proceeds. So that's including everything. It's not just general fund. It's so debt service fund, insurance, risk management. Water sewer. Well, water is down below. So that's shown their budget separately. And electric department. That's not included. Electric and schools are not in our um, ERP software. Mod, you know, they're they're handled separately. It does show our transfer to schools, and that service is also. Um, you know, we, we pay the schools that service, but as far as their operating information, it would not be found here. But this shows the, the different funds that are included. We've got general fund, the bond fund debt service, insurance, risk management, airport and drug. You know, and it shows that general fund's obviously so much larger that these look very tiny in comparison. What's that 346 million versus the 319? Sorry, it just, it was the one that was just up there. I apologize. Up at the top left corner? Yeah. I would imagine that's also including water in total because you can, you can, when you first click on things, you can choose it between city and water. Okay. So we've got the cards for the revenue and operating budgets, which are uh, um, compare it to budget. And we also have where you can look at the city's checkbook, basically. And we call that open checkbook. 
So if we go in here, you can see, again, a snapshot of um, the city's expense or um, payments for the year. And so if, let's say I just want to drill down the airport fund. And their largest expense is supplies for resale, and you want to see, well, what does that make up? Okay, aviation fuel, that makes sense. You know, uh, that's one of their largest operating expenses is their aviation fuel sales. So you can see it you know, by everything that's in that account. You can also click on that vendor specifically and see payments over time, and you can see how that really varies from month to month and then throughout the years. If you want to see specific details, you can go to the checkbook and see that vendor, what check we paid, what the amounts have been. You can see you can drill down to quite low detail there. I'm going to go back and you may say, okay, well, I want to look at, at all the city's vendors. Um, so you can just click there and go directly to the checkbook and you can sort that as, as ascending or descending and see all the various payments for the city. You can sort it by department, description, you know, check number or amount. If you also want to do a search, you know, based on a specific vendor, you can go up um, on that home screen and just type in a vendor. So Staples is used quite a bit. Let's see if it'll, so you can just click that and that'll take you directly to the checkbook view where you can see all the payments and which departments use that particular vendor and what we, you know, how much we've spent. Real time, I mean. As of last night. Okay. So it updates each evening, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. We want to keep it. Some, I, I know when we were doing the setup, Socrata said, you know, most people only update once a week. I, I just didn't know why not just to do it every night if they could do it. It doesn't cost any more or anything else and just keeps it, keeps it very current for us. The information too that you're viewing, you know, when you go in, if you want to download that, you know, pr I think pretty much all of it is downloadable into a CSV uh, file, which can be converted to Excel very easily as well. I think this is fabulous. Yeah. Any questions? If you get into it and have questions about how it works, feel free you know, to, to reach out to me. And, um, and we're still kind of tweaking the views and, and things like that, you know, what information might show up in the common questions and different things like that. But Have we thought about, this is a workshop, so don't, let me throw this out because I don't know. I have never, this is one board that I've never gotten a monthly financial statement. Is there something that could distill all of the information of how money transfers through this that could be a distilled report on a monthly basis that could tell us what is the financial position that, I mean, this is wonderful. This is amazing information. I, I don't know how, I mean, I'm so glad we're, we're here. But it's still, you know, for somebody to kind of understand mm -hmm. all of the position of the city, financial position, it's it's a hard thing. You'd have to still spend a lot of time to kind of sort through that. Is there, is there? We've talked about that off and on. There's so many different variables into what goes into it and the different funds. Uh, we've talked about would there be like key revenue items? Key revenue items that you would be more interested in or um, the expenditures or larger roll-ups because there is a lot that goes into each of the numbers. We've got some numbers that we book monthly that we get from the state. We get them throughout the throughout the month, but we usually make one big entry at the end of the month. So that one 
that's got big numbers and it's got sales tax in it, which I think we shared with the mayor. I'm not sure who else is on that email. Um, but we'd be glad to work with you on that and see if we could come up with something that would be useful to you. Obviously, this gives you detail to a very low level, but as far as an actual report, we might could work something up that, that would be helpful. Well, I think over a period of time, it, it may not... Uh it may be something that has to be a work in progress, you know, because you don't know exactly what important information are until you've mm -hmm. kind of fleshed that out a little bit. So, you know, uh, it may take us a while to get to something that we're satisfied with. But I think over a period of time, if we had that kind of, these are important things to kind of keep an eye on, then at least we would, if something shifts or we have a great expenditure or something, you know, it, it gives you a, a way to kind of see, uh, you know, what's going on, and I, I don't know. I know it's I know it's a difficult process. I, you know, looked at it myself trying to make a recommendation, and I, and you see we haven't gotten a recommendation. So, uh, uh, but I think it might be appropriate for us to look at this if we're going to have this kind of information available to the public, to have some kind of a distilled way of reporting it. So, anyway, thank you. We, we can take a look and, and give uh, a bit more dashboard information and put it out to council. Um, so we'll look, at, we'll look at that over the next couple months and see what we can come up with. It would be, it would be high level and be somewhat dated so, because we're always catching up, but it would give you a good snapshot of where we're at at a given time. So we can certainly do that. All right. Mayor, if we can move to the next. Great. Um, we talk about budget for 2020, uh, begin our discussions. I think the plan today is to present to you uh, more or less where we're at right now as far as our uh, projected 19 budget and the 20 budget and where we're, where we're heading as a trend over time. Uh, I wanted to give you the information today. We can certainly talk about anything that you want to talk about today. And uh, our meet next meeting will be Thursday at 5 o'clock. And at that point in time, we'd like to have your questions answered as much as possible, uh, either there at that meeting or beforehand, uh, so we can get some direction and build a budget that we'll have to you as required by at least by May 15th. So that's the target date. Um, you have in front of you booklets that has uh, information in it that uh, shows you uh, where we're at. Um, you remember last year um, a budget, uh, Mr. Crumley presented a budget to you and that budget included 10% cuts, uh, 10 10 cuts in non-salary operating budgets. Um, so the departments worked very, very hard to have those cuts in their, in their operating budgets not impact services and they did some really yeoman work, particularly departments like Parks and others who really worked hard not to have that impact services. Uh, we're kind of at a point now where we are as lean as we possibly can be without impacting services. Uh, so there's not much more we can uh, we can do on that side of it. Um, the other thing that we are considering as we went through this is that council's direction was to try and eliminate our reliance on fund balance in balancing our budget each year. Um, so uh, when I think it was a couple, two, two, three year phase out that we wanted to do that in. And so that was part of the thinking that we have and what we'll recommend to council come next Thursday on how we would uh, accomplish that goal. Currently, I want to stress that we are in good financial condition. I don't want that to bypass because we are going to talk about a budget that has some difficulties and there are answers and solutions for it. Uh, and we will come up with those. But uh, I don't want anybody to walk away. I don't want the public to misunderstand that we are not in good financial condition right now. We had our audit, it came back, the audit showed that we are very strong and we are strong now. We do have a healthy fund balance. We are within our financial policies right now, um, well within our financial policies that we have set. And those policies are very conservative relative to other cities, uh, certainly our side, but even size even larger cities. Uh, we have conservative financial policies and we are, uh, we are strong in that respect. It's really the trend in what we're looking for and whether we need to make adjustments now. I think in the past we've done budgets one year at a time and what we wanted to do is to take a little broader look uh, over a period of time and seeing where we're trending so that we can avoid anything that would cause us uh, some, some degree of difficulty in the future. Um, so we projected financial 
the model and if you turn to your you have in front of you but up here on the screen you, sh you see the pro forma for uh, projected for 19 and then uh, 20 and 21 um, and you can see the numbers here uh, where, where revenues are much higher in expenses which is really the trend that we're looking at over time unless some adjustments are made um, we uh, what your what's reflected here it incorporates into these numbers uh, requests that we have uh, received from the departments for additional supplements to uh, their budgets for last year uh, going forward so that they're able to maintain or enhance the services that they're providing to the citizens. So uh, that's included in this number. Also included in this number is a relatively conservative um, uh, CIP uh, borrowing. Um, we really worked hard to get that down to what we think is a necessary either by contract or commitment uh, or um, um, uh, what we need to do as far as roadways and such as that on our CIP borrowing for next year. That's corporate in there. Obviously these are still decisions that council has to make so it's not to suggest that uh, we can't make more adjustments on that or council could have different um, uh, a different view of what we've suggested on here. Um, but you can see we're trending over the next couple of years uh, with revenues continuing to be less than ex uh, expenses. Uh, and if we continue to do that uh, sooner or later we run uh, into an issue with our uh, fund balance policy. The policy that council has set on the fund balance is that we stay within 15 to 30 percent of our operating revenues um, and as we are a growing uh, city, growing in population, growing in uh, our, our requirements as far as infrastructure, um, the policy dictates that we should stay at the upper end of that. Uh, and so as far as the recommendations we'll make to council, we'll seek to, to hit those policy goals. Uh, that's a range, it's a rather large range, uh, particularly now that we have a budget that's this, at, that incorporates this much uh, money. Uh, it's a large range, uh, so council does have decision points and I don't only want to suggest with all these numbers here that, um, that they don't have decision points to, to make as we go forward. Um, but there is obviously something that, that we need to take a hard look at going forward. As far as expenses cuts, we've looked very hard at those. Um, some of our expenses, our largest expense, obviously, is salary and benefits, as you can see up there. Uh, we spent last year adjusting our salary and benefits to make sure that we're within the market. And our market's very difficult on employment right now. We are lower than what anybody ever defined as full employment was years ago. We're, we're well below that number and so we are, as we go out to hire people, replace people that are leaving the city for retirement or other, other reasons, um, we have to be competitive in that marketplace to get good people um, or otherwise they have alternatives. And um, so that salary and benefits portion of our budget, which is somewhere around 40% I think we figured um, we can't do much about if we want to stay competitive unless we want to cut out programs that we need people for. We're a customer service organization. We work with people um, and we provide services through people, generally speaking. So uh, if we don't have the people, then we, we're not able to provide the services. We're not able to provide them at the, at the level that um, our citizens enjoy right now. Um, our other um, larger portion of our budget uh, in any one segment is our debt service and obviously we want to manage that. Um, you have in there some information concerning both salary and debt. Uh, well, let me back up. For our debt service, the largest thing that uh, impacts that is the construction cost because a lot of that on our capital improvements is what it costs to build things, roadways, buildings, the things that, that uh, we need to provide uh, for our citizens to provide for our employment base. Um, those, those costs have risen enormously over the last few years um, and they'll, they'll, it looks like they'll continue to rise as demand uh, draws both of those ever upward uh, and we need to be cognizant of that fact. But that segment is rising um, from a debt service standpoint um, and it's rising because of costs, not interest rates. Interest rates have been have been very low and continue to be low and we had a borrowing last year that was at a very good competitive rate. Um, but we had to borrow the money we needed to accomplish projects and the cost of those projects are very expensive. So those being the two biggest portion of our debt, 
um, and our expenses, uh, you'll see a, here a line item, other expenses in there, it's a large number, but it's made up of a lot of small numbers, a lot of smaller numbers. There's not a lot we can do to make a big difference on this by cutting out expenses anymore. Again, unless we impact what we offer, our programs and, and our services that we offer. And of course we can always cut in that standpoint if we had to. From a revenue standpoint, um, we've been somewhat stable. Uh, we've had over the last several years, we've enjoyed uh, a rise in sales taxes um, as we've built out um, more and more retail. Uh, obviously, um, the Gateway, Medical Center Parkway, and the retail that went in there added a tremendous amount both to the county but also to our budget from a sales standpoint, but we're starting to mature in that growth, um, not adding a, a tremendous amount more than what we saw in the past. The other thing that contributed to our revenues on on our budget, on our revenue side, was land sales. And we, we uh, uh, council was very wise in investing in land out there as it developed, and we were able to sell that at a uh, or use that uh, profitably, um, but we're out of land. We don't have a whole lot more land out there. Uh, and so that um, stabilizer will go away as far as an increase in our, in our land sales, um, which means that our revenues are somewhat, somewhat stable, much less uh, growing, much less still growing. And that's, that's a good thing because growth will bring that in, but still growing at a, at a lesser rate than, uh, than our expense, than our, uh, yeah, at a lesser rate than our expenses. So, um, and I, I provided you some factual points in there and some of the numbers that uh, you can see from the indexes that measure those kind of costs and uh, in our growth. Um, our most stable, as it is with most cities, our most stable uh, source of income is our property tax. And it's particularly stable in uh, Tennessee because it's not assessed every year. It's only assessed every four years, uh, which means every four years um, it will, more if we're growing, um, it will, uh, it, well, if we're growing, that's reflected in just the general increase that we will see year over year. But the big increase in the assessment value is our property values going up. So as we invest in our community and make our community a uh, much more desirable place for people to live, obviously prices go up on houses, uh, businesses go up because they're able to, to um, uh, the commercial property becomes much more valuable because people want to locate here. Um, so the valuation and our, our reassessment of the value, ours, the county's reassessment of value that they assign to us uh, is increasing and it jumps up every four years. So that adds a degree of stability uh, to us, but we have to go through a equalization if you saw last year. So what we've done over the last 20 years since we had a tax increase is that we've equalized our tax rate. So our tax rate is less than 50% of what it was in 1999. It has dropped by half. Um, while our valuations of properties continue to go up. So uh, we're at less than one cent on $100 right now, and in 1999 we were at 1.9 cents on 100. So uh, we've dropped substantially on, on our property tax valuation. We've been able to, to, to go for some period of time because we've had increases in values, but um, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a battle to keep afloat uh, if every four years we're dropping uh, a substantial amount. Can I ask you a question? This thing just popped into my head. And this, this oh, is that's always those, dangerous. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but this is one of those little things that I always have a little trouble with making sure I'm, I'm thinking right on this, but I think it's right. So from, from the terms of 1999 to now right. and tax rate getting cut in half, yeah. you know, we we think of things in terms of when we have increased property taxes that the where that comes from is the new property owners. New right, property new owners. Right? Right. Because if your rate doesn't change, it's only the new property you add. If we equalize our rate every right. year, then the only way you get new property tax money right. is by new, new properties. Right. New development, right? Right. But somebody I don't think I've ever thought about before, and make sure I'm right in thinking this. So somebody who moved here last year, for example, while the rate's half of what it was, mm -hmm. we're really, they are really paying property taxes on a value of the house in 1999. Based well, on, because they're getting to take advantage of a half, a 50% lower tax rate mm -hmm. 
on a house which is by you know is, is higher but it, they're yeah. paying maybe the same amount of taxes as somebody would have in 1999 if the price of houses is doubled in that same time frame yeah. which would make sense because the property tax has decreased by half right that's right so they're that's paying the same that. amount of taxes on a brand new 2,000 square foot house or whatever that somebody was paying on a brand new square foot, 2,000 square foot house in 1999. Pretty much. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, on an individual taxpayer, because it's an aggregate number, right? So you're gonna you're gonna take a big, giant number and and to to, to yeah. equalize. So yeah. an individual homeowner may argue with yes, you on that. Yes, 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 right. But generally speaking, conceptually, yes, you're right. From an economic standpoint, that's exactly what would happen. That's interesting. Sorry. I have a question. Um, if we go and vote on the uh, ambulance service, what expense would that come out of? Well, I, I, let me yeah, tell you. go ahead. There's been some significant development since we met. I guess it was a month ago we met. Yeah. yeah. So we met um, really the week after, and uh, long story short, there's been significant changes at Rutherford County EMS. Chief probably can give a little more detail, but we've had a couple of meetings since then. Um, we met, was it last Friday? We, we walked through with all the county uh, leadership and they were we walked through this building and they were sold on our dispatch so it looks like that we're going to be working on a plan that we're co-locating dispatch will be in the new dispatch building and uh, more partnering we continue to partner with Rutherford County EMS so we don't think that there's going to be a significant fund change on on uh, on what we're doing I, I think since uh, the last couple of weeks the, the level of cooperation has been something that we've not seen in ever since uh, so yeah so we're we're really excited about the direction it's headed so I don't think it'll affect our budget this year at all right that's what we anticipate Thank So a couple of things, a couple of additional things to cover. We do have some one-time revenues that we think will be coming in uh, on the uh, this downtown land sale is um, the um, the former uh, First United Methodist Church. Sorry, I blanked on that. First United Methodist Church property. Um, as far as an update on that, uh, real quickly, we had met with the uh, developer. I'm um, looking for Gary. He's not here yet, but we met with the uh, developer, I want to say last week or the week before that, to give us an update on that. And they're, pr they're proceeding uh, with their studies and their finances. Uh, they pretty much have their investment uh, lined up on that. Um, their house, they're working on their, the housing uh, part of that um, because there's no com comparables in uh, downtown. It's a little bit more challenging to get financing on that, but they're working on that diligently. Uh, they anticipate meeting their deadline, which if I remember correctly, it's July. they have until July 4th to close on the property. Um, so they're, they're working diligently to meet that and believe that they can. Uh, close on the property and start to move forward and what we've requested is uh, they immediately get busy right after they close and start to, to do it. They, they've been out to do um, all the engineering studies. Uh, they were going to go out, I think it was last week, and start um, doing some geotech and actually uh, drilling some holes in various places to, to make sure that uh, their geotech information that they had was um, what they needed to, to start that property. So we anticipate that closing uh, on time and in, in next year right now. Um, the, the other thing is um, we've uh, additional revenue, we've talked about uh, rebalancing our health care fund. Uh, we think we have uh, a reserve there that we can we can work on and, and we're working on a plan right now. So preliminarily we've included that in a, a revenue source and we'll continue to, to solidify that plan. We do have uh, some expenses about, and we have a substantial amount of expenses, uh, about $7 million. 3.7 of that includes uh, the supplements we'll talk about in just a second to our budget. Um, um, but we have some additional costs in here that um, are uh, impacting our expense number. Um, right 
one, uh, a million four you'll see is uh, really a result of some of the reductions that we made last year in managing our overtime and part-time uh, employees. We have to be somewhat careful of those, particularly the part-times. You can only use them so much before you run into uh, an issue with part-time employees from the standpoint of providing health care costs. So we can only use them 30 hours a week, so we have to manage that very closely. And the biggest part of that is uh, parks and, uh, you know, Nate, Nate, Nate and his folks put a lot of effort into trying to utilize their people as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, we had additional pension. We talked about that, uh, and we still have to talk about one, and we, but we put in here a number for um, some increases in uh, the pension that have been discussed if council decides to do that. So it's a preliminary number now, but we know that about 600 and it's about 600,000 of that is uh, because of the long-term rate of return reduction that we have on our anticipated uh, return. Um, and we have some one-time expenses with uh, school opening. Um, and we'll talk about uh, debt shortly. So if you want to turn over to your supplements tabs, you have a list of, um, this shows up very big, reduce it a little bit. You have a list of what uh, the departments have requested for um, next year um, with an indication of the side of what would be an ongoing expense, so that would add to the subsequent year uh, as opposed to a one-time expense. Um, they are prioritized uh, one, two, and three on there, depending upon what council decides to do as far as uh, uh, an adjustment on revenue or uh, or not. Number one are ones that we uh, we really feel as a staff that uh, needs to be accomplished. Uh, we do have uh, some preliminary numbers on Saturday bus service that's not on here, but we can put that on there f uh, based on the discussion today and incorporate it in there. I think it's about. Uh, it's all rest about 110, 120. <laughs> right. For Saturday. So 110 for three routes would That's be Saturday. the number. That would be Possibly for Saturday, Saturday. service, yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate that because that's really weighing on me because, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you said we're a city of uh, service orient, oriented, and that's true. And, you know, we have to hit all the citizens. And I respect what Mr. Lalance said about the Uber. You know, I know Uber's very popular and Lyft, they are very popular. But I'm speaking of these people who cannot afford a Lyft or Uber, who are also citizens in our city. And so, and I know as a, we're running a business. I, I realize that. But a lot of times in life, I think we let money overpower the needs of people. And as a council, since I've been on this council, we found money for everything else when we really, and it's a need. So I, I'd like for us to take a serious look at that. Yeah, and we can certainly do that and incorporate that in for, we'll send you a sup supplement on this. Um, but as you look through those, if you have any questions on those between now and next week, um, please let us know. Uh, we can provide you any additional information that you uh, you might need on on those. As you can see, some are for uh, contractual agreements. Some are, as we incorporate, as the mayor said, in uh, the dispatch into our dispatch center, what we would need on, need on there. Um, just so you feel comfortable, we did cut out almost a million four and other requests. So we've been somewhat judicious in this, in getting to the number that we did of about 3.8. Um, but that's that, that 3.8 brings us all the way down. The ones that we really feel like we would need would be um, 1.9, and then on a close second would be a million. And then, um, not to say that these aren't needed, but certainly, so if we get if we have enough uh, room, we'd like to to see additional um, supplements to the budget for about eight hundred thousand dollars. A lot of this gets us back to um, to a le providing a level of service that we did before some of the cuts were made. What's an example of the unfunded, the million something we cut? What's an example of unfunded funds that we cut? Um, well, I don't remember where the cut, all the cuts in. I wasn't 
uh, too close to all the cuts, but we, it, Saturday sat, well, Saturday service <laughs> for, for one. Uh, but uh, I know we cut, um, we cut almost a million out. Aaron looked at the numbers today. And of course, repairs are deferred. You don't cut those, you just defer them. There was a software, um, equipment, personnel requests, just very, various items. It was kind of all over the board. Okay. I would, if it's convenient, I, I'd like to take a list of that, uh, look at a list of that itemized, unfunded things we cut. Yes, ma'am. Any questions on that? As far as our, the other thing that you have with us, or with, uh, with your packet is um, our capital improvement projects for this year. Um, let me explain to you how that's, it's presented to you with a total project cost and then an anticipated operating cost so you can get some idea of the operating costs that we would incur as we went, as we go forward. Um, you know, there's a column there for non-debt funding. That would be a source of something other than debt. Uh, for example, land sales. If we sell land, we would uh, use all or part of that. Uh, to fund some of the projects. So these are, in the past, I think we've talked about CIP as only representing what we would go out and, and uh, incur debt for. Um, but really it's a capital improvement project of all projects that are capital oriented that we would, um, that, that we would be anticipating over the next year. Um, and you also have in there a five-year one, so the next five years. Um, so it doesn't mean that every one will be borrowed for. And if we can find ways not to borrow for it or if we adjust our borrowing some way that uh, meets really the life cycle of the capital, we'd probably want to do that. Uh, some of those projects have been previously funded, so they, then you can see what we're looking for in 2020. And then the amount that would uh, follow to complete the project is in the deferred amount deferred past 2020. If you look at your five-year CIP, you'll see um, an amount deferred that's defer deferred obviously past the five-year uh, time horizon. So again, if you have any questions uh, about these um, before next Thursday or at next Thursday, we'll be certainly prepared to, to answer those. If you have any questions now, obviously, we, most of our department directors are here and we were happy to, to talk about um, talk about what we have in here. The bottom line number is about 24, uh, 24 million. So um, 24 million, are you doing the math on the debt service? Is that what you're doing? No. No, yeah, okay. I'm going to figure that out. Ahead. Can you? Yeah, yeah, close enough. Yeah, excellent. So how are we up to 54 million on West Park all of a sudden? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Um, oh, scroll up. Hey, 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 no line eight. I mean, we're, is we, Nate, that was never, I mean, I'm. Is Nate here? Or Angela? See, that's what I was saying. I guess at the end of the day, yeah, the council may, I mean, may want to talk about that. I mean. Yeah, we, we can talk about that. A, that's obviously a, a number that's, if we build everything that they think, you know, that the 2035 plan says we need for the city, you know, or whatever. Um, and, and I would have never bought that piece of property expecting no. to build a $54 million park on it. I no, no, that. and, and the, the, the one thing about the West Park here is now that we've talked about what we're going to do in that land and had some changes to plan it now incorporates that 96 property and what we would do out here. But that's both. It, well, it would, yeah, it would, it would be both parks on the west side and um, not, not all of that financing and it would include planning costs. Obviously you have two parks now planning. I think it, it probably, I could be wrong, but I think it incorporates the sewer costs to, on, on both properties. So there's some costs in there that as we develop it, it may change over time. 
the, the, so as we look at projects, we want to bring you as accurate as we can. Obviously, you don't want to tell you that you know we're going to do something for a lot cheaper than what we could actually do it. So the numbers may be somewhat conservative in that they're somewhat high. Um, they're still my, that's we're not done planning that. There's a lot of work to be done on that, and a lot of opportunity for council to weigh in on that. Um, yeah, I know. I guess what I'm way, doing is weighing in. Right. I mean, you know, I, I'll go ahead and get my way in out of the way now and say, yeah. look, as y'all are playing in, you know, planning on this stuff. Right. I wouldn't be planning on 54 million. I mean, the at the end of the day, we will have taken we will have taken both of those people, pieces of property and shrunk them mm -hmm. a bit. We're going to be getting a lot of funding back from it, mm -hmm. but you know all that is is coming back to the the I mean ultimately to the general fund. I mean you know as far as how that incorporates in our total budget. So and, and that's multiple so, years of development as well. That's not developing. I mean I can't I I, I think. A lot of that, a lot of that would be deferred out, and uh, you know we have to watch that line out there. But a lot of that would probably even be deferred out, perhaps past the five years, depending on on how we stage it out. Next year, the four hundred thousand is is more planning, so there'll be more definitive information being provided to council um, as as we go about the project. But. Um, uh, but we can go back and take a harder look at where the 54 well, million our, came from. Our current budget, that 2020 funding, mm -hmm. um, the you know the 400,000. I, I don't, you know, I, we we probably need to hear from from Nate or Angela on that as far as what that really gets us. But we've done a heck of a lot of spending money on planning that stuff, and of course we know, obviously, with our experience that it morphs. Yeah, and transition. it did more substantially, yeah. It's going to need some more planning. Yeah. But it seems like we got a lot of the planning already done. At this point, it seems like we need some engineering. Well. Just, we, we know what we need. Yeah, and we got some of the engineering yeah. done uh, as far as uh, what do you get, water water retention and things like that. Some of that's out there. So we do know, know quite a bit, but we layered in another section of land on there. Um, and so that one we didn't do much at all other than you know, really conceptual drawings on that. So a lot of that hasn't been um, completely programmed from a cost standpoint. So it, it was a, it was a big change. I know they had gotten far down the road with the the planners, and um, we changed it quite a bit. And I think the change is over a long term to quite a bit of our advantage, to the city's advantage, and the advantage of the community out there. Um, but um, it. You know, we, we will incur some cost in, in getting to that point. But obviously, if we build a park out there, it's out there for a, a very long time, so we don't want to do it wrong. Any other comments and questions on that? So as I said, I want to leave this with you to study, think about. Um, we're available for questions um, either before the meeting on Thursday or at the meeting on Thursday. Um, we want to do an overview then and if we could get some uh, good direction, we don't have to have necessarily the last decision because you'll you'll vote on it sometime in May on uh, adopting the budget so we'll have some time in there but if we could get some definition from council on uh, some conceptual things so that we could build our budget that's uh, that's really where we'd need to go by next Thursday Expecting moving forward for our budget, this will be looking more like this as opposed to going down department by department like we have in the past. Um, I mean, uh, that would be my recommendation that we take a bit more. Con the council takes a more comprehensive look. Obviously, we are as, sure. as a staff going department by department. That doesn't mean that department won't be accessible 
certainly big costs, for example, the parks, uh, that if, if there's a need to have a department director stand up and do more explanation, they'll be completely accessible to council as we go forward. But generally speaking, the, the initial presentation, and if we can get to a decision point by looking at high level numbers and such, I think that's probably a more productive way to go. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Craig, thank you. We'll look forward to Thursday night. All right, we have um, a beer permit that we need to vote on. Mayor, this is a new location for a restaurant at 206 North Thompson Lane. Uh, the summaries on the back, they do still lack their building codes inspections, but otherwise their uh, application is in order. If you approve it, we would issue that permit once they've satisfied their building and codes requirements. Okay. Can we get a motion? So moved. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, and then we have under other business, Mr. Tucker, I believe you have something. Yes, uh, something very brief here. Uh, the Transportation and Risk Management Departments are requesting your approval to renew the city's commercial vehicle insurance coverage for the city's rover buses for up to an additional 12 months. Uh, for the past uh, two years, the city has maintained a commercial vehicle insurance policy for the rover buses with Berkshire Hathaway Home State Companies. Um, this policy is written through uh, Miller Lowry Beach Insurance Services. Um, the annualized premium for a 12 month period ending April 2020 is $76,533, but because this is an insurance um, that on capital assets that are uh, partially funded through uh, federal and state funds, um, the city would get reimbursed 90% um, of that cost, 80% for the federal government, 10% from uh, the state. So the total uh, fiscal impact of this insurance um, would only be uh, $7,000 and six hundred and fifty three dollars and thirty cents. Any questions? Second. Motion a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, there you go. Do we have any other other business? Other other business. Mr. Tennell, we're expecting to meet next Thursday night, correct? Next Thursday at five. Next five. Thursday at five. Um Sorry, before we before we close this out, and, and maybe what would be a good idea is if you guys are, are going to go in and make any kind of adjustments to this spreadsheet um, as it relates to questions that were asked or adding in new things or something like that, you know, I think we need new supplements. Now, yeah. yeah, we need a well, we need probably a new updated version that is all the the corrected numbers or the you know the 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 numbers that whatever changes would be made perhaps and because I mean we're gonna you know I think we're all gonna have to have a discussion I don't know what the format needs to be or should be but I assume that's gonna be next Thursday at five o'clock right I mean the reality is we got 14 million dollars of spend down in the budget right now and you know we're having some discussions about making that number bigger there's maybe some council members that want to make that number smaller. Right. Um, we got to figure out how to, you know, which direction we're going to go on that and how we're going to get there. Right. And then also how we're going to balance the budget once we come to a conclusion on what that number looks like. Is that is that is that the format for next Thursday night? That's the format for next Thursday night. We have a hard stop for seven o'clock meeting, but if we need to schedule for the following week to get another meeting, then we'll certainly do that. And if we have, the, if we can get updated spreadsheets that will give, right. give us something to work off of between now and Thursday to kind of do some note taking and yep. ideas and stuff like that. And I encourage everybody, you know, we need, we, now's the time for ideas. Right. Um, so, so let's, you know, write those things down. Let's make sure we get them addressed on Thursday and, and get this thing knocked out. Mr. Chandler, I haven't studied the, the financial ratios, but if, if there are any key ones that you'd like to draw attention to as we're doing this, I think it'd be great to line those up with the mm -hmm. historical look forwards as far as where we are and where we think we will be based on projections. I think our, our primary ratio is what we how we're handling our fund balance and what it's looking for, forward. And you'll see uh, the, the at the bottom of your pro forma sheet, you'll see the, uh, the fund balance uh, ratio and where that heads 
and um, in the policy in short form next to it there. Um, but yeah, if there's if there's any other uh, the other the other major uh, one is is our debt financial policies and what we're doing with debt. And I will tell you, well, we're well within those policies now, and and we do have the capacity to to handle. That's not to suggest that we should, but I mean, it's you know, we're, that's the other policy we want to obviously pay very close attention to. The other financial policies we have, and we have several, um, we're okay with. We're looking pretty good. And also, uh, by next Thursday, will the outside agencies, will we see a breakdown of the outside agencies? In we their requests? Yeah. Have we re yeah, we received those, and we'll get those to you uh, as soon as they come in so you have them before Thursday's meeting to take a look at. Thank you. Here before you adjourn, I'd like to introduce a new staff member, okay. Jennifer Vickery. Stand up. She's she's the new assistant finance director, and we are very happy to have her with us. Great. Thank you. Congratulations. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I was going to use a word in front of that, but I'm not going to use that. So, <laughs> all right. Seeing none, we'll stand adjourned.